So, uh, as Jared said, my name is Michelle Gill. Um, I'm a senior data scientist at Benevolent AI, so I sort of trained myself up um, in, in data science and machine learning after, after I became a scientist. So that's the side of the coin that won there. So put your chemistry hats on, um, because we're going to talk about uh, artificial intelligence and chemistry today. So a little bit about Benevolent AI. Before I begin, we are 200 life scientists AI scientists, bioinformaticians, cheminformaticians, and we all work side by side towards the purpose of uh, rapidly accelerating drug discovery. Um, our, techni our technology pipeline is validated in-house by our own uh, experimental results. We have drug discoverers, chemists as well. And um, we're the only AI company with capabilities from the early stage through the late stage of the drug development process. So before we begin, a little bit of uh, biochemistry nomenclature. So a target, so this may look like the Pac-Man that uh, Jared mentioned this morning, if you were here, but we're gonna du uh, dual purpose our Pac-Man. Um, so this is a target, and this is a molecule within an organism uh, that is associated with a disease, and it's the intended, uh, the intended destination for a therapy. Often this is actually a protein in real life. It doesn't look like a Pac-Man. So a compound, or lead, is a chemical that binds to this target, and it, uh, it, it will cure or treat a disease. Um, unfortunately, usually when you first find a compound that will bind to a target, it has other properties that are undesirable. Uh, drug discovery is a really complicated process. And so some of those properties um, that we try to optimize after we discover a lead, uh, things like we want it to be extremely effective at low doses. We want it to have a low amount of side effects. We do, don't want it to be toxic, obviously. Um, and so once we uh, go through the iterative process of optimizing those properties, we call it a drug. So that's a compound or lead who has been, that has been highly optimized through this iterative process. And so if that sounds like a long and arduous process uh, to you, you'd be correct. Uh, there are estimates that it can take between well, 1.8 billion, that's actually a low estimate, uh, to get all the way from the early stages of drug discovery through the three phases of clinical trials and to submission, um, and it can also take in excess of 10 years. The higher estimates are about two and a half billion to about 15 years. So it's an incredibly long process. And so our, our goal at Benevolent AI is to accelerate this process with machine learning. And so we use uh, a, a variety of data sources. We use uh, publicly available data sets, databases. Um, we have our own unstructured pipeline where we mine the scientific literature, we mine patents, abstracts, um, all kinds of uh, textual data. Uh, we also have our in-house experimental data that we feed back. And we aggregate this all together into a, a graph that we use to train our machine learning models. And so we use that throughout all stages of the drug discovery process. So from target identification, uh, the early stages, through lead optimization, which is actually what I'm going to tell you a little bit about today. And then the results from lead optimization feed into our own clinical trials, and that again feeds back into uh, our, our graph of knowledge that we maintain. And so a little bit about lead optimization, sort of my favorite part of the, the drug discovery process, is what we're going to cover. So exploring the compound universe is incredibly challenging. Uh, the, the space of, of compounds is between 10 to the 20 and 10 to the 60, depending upon how you estimate it. Um, but often we're only interested in really small regions of this compound space, and they're very discrete. And so what we want to do, and, and this is the actual representation of a compound, uh, the way a chemist would draw it, they're not really squares or triangles, um, is identify a compound that binds to that target and then we're going to use exploration to sort of iteratively scan through that space by making small changes as we hope to identify these and improve these properties. So if you, uh, those of you who are computer scientists, uh, you might be thinking of this as sort of a search policy or a search, uh, a search method, and it kind of is. And so we can formulate this as a problem that we can address with machine learning and perhaps use generative algorithms, which I'll go over in, uh, in just a moment, to, to create novel compounds. And you know, these machine learning models know and have been trained on uh, a, a vast array of compounds, and so hopefully they can help us identify compounds that have these better improved properties that can convert them into drugs. So, so just to really pose the question, how can we e efficiently explore such a vast universe in a property-driven and in a really efficient way? So this is what the compound design cycle looks like. So a chemist, based on experimental knowledge, based on their own knowledge that they've learned through experiments, will design a compound. 
then the chemist has to synthesize it, uh, usually through a multi-step process in the lab, and then we'll test. So a variety of experimental assays that will test the properties of the compound, the safety, all of these things that we really need to improve upon. However, if we're able to sort of supplement our chemist with, it, with an AI version of our chemist, we can accelerate this process by doing some of these steps in silico. So we call this the de novo design process, and it parallels what I just described in real life. So that process, uh, in the computational sense, looks like this. So we will design a compound through search and optimization uh, policies, and then we will make it, which is really actually quite trivial because computers can know how, they know how to assemble molecules. We have various rules, we have programs that do this for us, and then we can test it. So we use machine learning models to predict these properties, to, to determine if it will actually bind to a, a computational representation of our target, um, and, and then we can iterate much more quickly uh, computationally and then be selective about what we decide to take back into the lab and test experimentally. So this is sort of like a generative model, which for those of you who, who maybe don't have experience with this, this is a, um, in this context, it's specifically a deep learning model that's going to generate compounds. And we're going to, it's going to help us guide um, what experiments we do. And so drug discovery is really a multi-parameter optimization uh, problem, and I've sort of alluded to that. But we have a lot of properties that we need to think about at once. More properties, honestly, than a human, even a great chemist, can really keep, sort of keep track of it at one time. So we want it to, what's called affinity, we want this compound to really bind uh, to our target well, so that we don't have to use as much of it when, when we dose people. So we, we want to minimize the amount that, of the pill you have to take, for example. We want it to not be very toxic. Um, we don't want to harm the organism otherwise. Uh, you know, those are, those are side effects. And we want it to be selective. Uh, those are kind of, toxicity and selectivity are kind of related. But we, don't, we only want it to really bind to the target that we're interested in dosing. So, um, so this multi-parameter objective, um, we can use this with our machine learning models. And so let's talk about how we generate the best compounds. So this is uh, sort of a schema of what our, how our model training works. So we use a variety of compound data um, from this, this graph that we generate. Um, we featureize the compounds, and we'll go into more depth uh, about this, um, to create what we call a general model. We then refine that general model with reinforcement learning and, and user feedback. And from this model, we're able to get optimized compounds. So as a very brief aside, machine learning actually has a very, very long history in chemistry. So this is a paper, and I know you can't read the date, but it's from 1991. And this is Johann Gasteiger, who is a very famous computational chemist. And in this paper, um, he, he sort of muses that, that neural networks might be the next big thing in chemistry in 1991. It's very funny to read it because it reads like a lot of articles today. So uh, fast forward 17 years, um, and we've graduated from sort of the standard feed-forward networks that Gasteiger was using to, to deep learning models. Um, and Kemble is a particular database, but we're able to do very large-scale machine learning um, with the kind of data that we have in chemistry this, today. Um, and, and obviously, we use far more sophisticated models. So going back. Um, to our talking about how we generate the best compounds. So how do we represent molecules to a machine learning model? Uh, normally, if, if you have columns of data, you have features, perhaps you try to create some sort of, I don't know, uh, embedding. How, how, do we, how do we represent molecules? Well, there's some tricks. Um, so, so one of the ways uh, that we really uh, represent these molecules so that we can uh, teach these neural networks how to predict them um, we borrow some, uh, some ideas from language models. So you all uh, type on your phone. Uh, usually it gets good at predicting what your next word might be, the text. Um, so we can borrow from this and, and use, uh, adapt these language models to help featureize our compounds. So uh, there's something called smiles, which I will explain to you briefly um, in, in just a moment. But that's how we can represent these compounds. So you can see this compound on the right. And it can be represented with two Cs and an equal sign. So there's a, a numerical trick for representing these as text. And then we can adapt what, uh, what language models have taught us uh, in deep learning. And so effectively, what these models are really doing is, is simply predicting then what the next character is based on the previous ones. 
And so this, uh, I, I told you this was called SMILES. Um, this stands for Simplified Molecular Input Line Entry System. Um, it's, a, it's nothing new. Uh, it's, it's been around in, in chem informatics for quite a long time. But we can utilize it and sort of uh, harness this for uh, featureization of our compounds. Um, and so it's, a, it's effectively a symbolic string that's obtained from a depth first search through the compound. And then for any branching, uh, we have ways to, to, uh, to describe that. And so it creates what's effectively a string, like what you see at the bottom. So um, there, there are multiple ways to make these compounds, and standardization can be a challenge. Uh, this will become important. And then finally, um, chemical rules must be obeyed for validity. So there are ways to create, if you just randomly threw these characters together, you would violate the laws of, of chemistry. So uh, th there are some challenges with generating uh, valid molecules in the types of, uh, using the types of models I'm going to describe to you. So, so sort of bear those two things in mind. So what we use, I alluded to this uh, by saying that what we do is look at the previous characters. We use recurrent neural networks. So recurrent neural networks take an input, uh, like you can see with the X on the top, and they uh, make a prediction or spit out an output like you see with the Y on the bottom. But recurrent networks have a hidden state. They have memory. So they know what they have previously generated as output, and they have weights which help them remember how far back to look. So th this is how these networks that we're going to use will, um, will remember the characters they've previously generated. Um, and we specifically use which call, what is called an LSTM. It stands for long short-term memory. Um, it, it is a type of recurrent neural network. Um, and we, we create what is called an embedding. It's a numerical representation of these smile strings when we train our model. Um, and then we, uh, we put it through this LSTM, and it learns, uh, it learns to predict the next character. So if you follow along at the bottom, you can see it's predicting a 1, and then a couple of Cs, and then a 1, and then a termination. So the termination is how we know that's, a, that's its own character. That's how we know when it's done with the compound. Um, that C11, or C1CCC1 uh, terminator is effectively a compound called benzene, which hopefully is not uh, what's coming out of our model because it's a carcinogen. <laughs> but it's easy to draw. <laughs> so I've shown you um, our database of compounds and how we featureize them uh, with SMILES. We do a little bit of uh, selection off of, off of the public database. And then we train this LSTM model that I just showed you about, and we get new compounds. Great. So how, how, how do they look? Are they, are they giving us anything useful? So yes, um, they, it turns out to be a pretty good general model of, of chemical space. So this is a T-SNE embedding of a, a variety of compound properties. And the training data is shown in blue. And then we sample from our model, and that's shown in green. And so you can see we can recreate all of compound space pretty well here. And I told you a challenge with these models um, is that uh, whether or not they can generate valid compounds. And these are actually 95% uh, of these are actually valid. So it has learned some rules of chemistry. It's not just spitting out letters at us. Um, and we're able to also generate a variety of uh, a high degree of novelty with our compounds. So it's not just spitting out the same valid compound at once. So that's great. Um, but one of the challenges is with a, a drug discovery program, we don't need a really general model of the universe. What we need is a, a, a model that's really specialized. And we don't have a lot of data to train that model when we start a drug discovery program. So we use this general model as our basis um, and then we're going to refine it for whichever region of local space we want to look at. So for this purpose, we use uh, reinforcement learning. And this is actually a very simple type of reinforcement learning. And we combine that with user feedback. So we take our pre-trained LSTM model. Um, we sample compounds from it. Um, and we score it. Again, this is our multi-parameter objective. So we have a way of combining uh, models for the properties that we care about. And we score it. And then we retrain. And we repeat that iteratively. So this is a very simple uh, reinforcement learning method called hill climbing. And we just do that several times. And we allow our users, our chemists, to give us feedback if we need to adjust our objective, if there's something going wrong. Um, it is a process that is, still has scientists very much in the loop. So, so here's an example of what that might look like. Um, we sample compounds from our model, shown in blue. And then we're going to score them. We take the best, it's usually around 8,000. So you can see the bottom ones seem to score the best. And we're going to retrain. We present them to our chemists, and they can help us refine uh, what, we're, what the model is doing. 
So I will show you that with a very quick video. So you can see um, we are selecting a compound. So this is what it actually looks like. And it's going to be represented as a smile string. And then we don't want it to look like that compound, the furan, the small ring that you saw. So we're going to say uh, invert it. That's one, those are all parts of our multi-parameter objective. And then we can add some other properties um, that, that we care about. Like we don't want to deviate too far from the starting compound. So we'll add that as a property as well. And we can define how we represent it. Sometimes these are smiles. There are other ways of representing compounds. Um, so sometimes we adjust that based on uh, what we want to get out of it. And then you can see that we get um, a variety of compounds back. And so our chemist can give us feedback. So again, you know, I don't think we're ever, it'll be a long time before we're at the stage where we completely have scientists removed from the loop. Um, but, but this greatly helps us accelerate the process. So, so does it really work? Um, so yes. So this is uh, two representative compounds for a, a program uh, in ALS. So ALS is amyotrophic lateral sclerosis, also known as Lou Gehrig's disease uh, to many of you. Um, it is a neurodegenerative disorder. And so we were able to take these compounds um, and optimize their properties to make drugs in, in a, a very short amount of time. So less than three months versus the industry average of about a year and a half. Um, and so the properties that we optimize, um, affinity, so how tightly does it bind? Um, is it soluble? And then the last one is called uh, it, its ability to enter the brain. So this is a neurodegenerative disorder. So the compound has an additional challenge. It has to get, back, get past what's called your blood-brain blood barrier, uh, which is a protective mechanism. So that actually makes things even more difficult. So there's been external demonstrations just recently as well. So there's a validation of compounds that have been optimized into drugs um, by machine learning, and they found five highly active drugs uh, that have been produced. And so lastly, sort of just to conclude, um, measuring models and, and benchmarking our models is extremely important to us. And it's, it's fairly challenging in this case uh, with generative models. Do they give you something good? It's fairly easy to get a qualitative read. Um, sometimes if the model isn't doing so well, you get a, a very uh, explicit qualitative read from your chemists <laughs> in, the, in, the, in certain words that, that they're not happy with. Um, but but how, do you, how do you really measure this? And so we've come up with uh, a way that we believe is, is uh, a fair and sort of balanced way of measuring these generative models. And we look at two criteria. So can the model reproduce a broad distribution of, of chemical space, so what you saw with that TSNI embedding. So how well can you reproduce um, whatever chemical universe you give it? So there's a variety of metrics that we've posed in, in a, what we've developed as a benchmarking suite. Um, the second one, though, is that the general models are usually really good at being general models, but they're not great once you start optimizing them for a very specific question. So does that model then also adapt, or are you able to get it to to, uh, to drive a specific multi-parameter optimization. And so how well then do you really focus in on a specific area of space that you're interested in? And so we call this benchmarking suite Guacamole. Um, and we've published a, recently a paper on it. And there is code up on GitLab, or GitHub, excuse me. So uh, with that, and with that, um, I would like to thank you. So these are some of the people who, who've helped out with this work as well. So I'm available uh, today and tomorrow if you want to talk. <laughs>